If you're quiet about your pain, your pain will kill you and someone will say that you enjoyed it, which again takes me to the fact that we must speak. Otherwise, our pain will kill us. Our pain will become a thorn. It will grow into something that we cannot control and we shall die. Hello and welcome to Inspiring Open, candid conversations with influential women whose careers and open ethos have pushed the boundaries of what it means to build community and succeed as a collective. I am Betty Kamkambwedu, a journalist and women's rights advocate. Join me as I explore the fascinating backstories behind Africa's most tenacious female personalities. Inspiring Open is a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women, a project of Wiki in Africa. Be inspired, be challenged, be bold. Today, our guest is Hilda Tonjere. Hilda describes herself as feminist and woman activist, traits she discovered at an early age when she found herself always getting into trouble, defending women being unfairly treated in taxis, markets, classrooms, and other public spaces. She is a literary activist, an independent writing development consultant focusing on fiction and social development issues, especially to do with gender. She enjoys working in safe spaces that allow African women the liberty to share their often difficult stories. As a founding member of FemRight, she initiated the residency of African Women Writers, which is currently one of the most sought-after women's writing programs in Africa. Her writings also appear in different anthologies. Let's get right into it. Welcome to Inspiring Open Hilda. I am happy we finally have the time to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. I'm happy. I'm really thank you for the invitation. I know I've given you trouble for us to, you know, get that time, the right timing to be together. But yes, I'm so glad that we are finally at it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's begin by going into a bit of your background. How was growing up like? I grew up in a village setting. I I live in Kampala right now, but uh, I came into Kampala as an adult when I came to study, when I came to school for my HSC. But I grew up in a village setting. I love to say that uh, I come from the shores of Lake Bunyonyi in southwestern Uganda. If you ever visit Uganda, that's a place that you must you must come to. Somebody recently was talking about Uganda and he said, if uh, Uganda is the Switzerland of Africa, then Kabale is the Switzerland of, of, of Uganda. So, yeah, that's where I come from and uh, that's where I grew up from uh right as a baby and um my whole really childhood that's where i was that's where i went to school primary school uh secondary school part of my secondary school um yeah and i i grew up very fortunately with my both parents i have a uh, uh <laughs> <laughs> we are we are many children. We are three girls and uh, five boys. Yeah, two boys are gone. Three boys are still alive. Um, I grew up where, when I knew that when I get back from school, I need to help my mother prepare, prepare food, pre- you know, do some work around the house or even go to the gardens, it never, never came through as a punishment, no. And so for me, work is, you know, that's a, another thing that that I, I that influences me today. I'll, <laughs> I'll work and I, I will even forget that I need to get up and go and, and, uh, and go and take my lunch. I love the work bit because there is such dignity in work and sometimes we overlook that. So now seeing that you are a writer and editor, I am sure the love of books and reading featured in your life as a young woman. 
I rem- my dad had a small uh, a small cupboard which had where the top could have passed as a bookshelf but other things occupied that space but you would find one or two or three books and I th- I think, looking back, I think those books came into our family from my cousin. God rest his soul in peace. He came to live with us for his primary school, and he came with books. So that was my first interaction with books away from school. Otherwise, for me, books belonged to the school setting. I remember, I think I was in P. In primary four, and we had a teacher who had come uh, for school practice. He asked me to go and bring his novel on the table. I tell you the truth. I thought novel was the name of the book, not not a type of a book. Yeah. So I, I go and I don't find novel. I find things on that on his table, different books, and I'm looking for novel. Look at the books and what's novel? I go back to him, teach, I don't see novel. And he explains and I go back and pick it. So I, and then later when I went to secondary school, I went to a beautiful, beautiful secondary school, Bishop's Girls School, Muyebe. And we had teachers who were really, really interested in in literature, interested in in languages. And for the first time, I could get into a library and pick out books, you know, a lot of abridged series of of the big novels. Now I knew what a novel was. And so I think that school did so much in shaping me into uh, the, the life I lead now into loving literature, into loving language, into loving words and, and wanting to, to use words. And, um, I did well in literature, probably not so well in English, but I did well in literature. And later, when I went to, to college, I wrote a letter. I read, uh, I had read Ngugi Wathiongo in, in my secondary school, when I went to college and interacted with more of his books, I looked for an address. I don't remember how. Maybe it was in one of the books, uh, um, the, the publisher's address, maybe. I don't know. But I wrote to Ngugi Wathiongo when I was in, uh, when I was at college. And I got a reply, but the reply wasn't uh, from him directly, but from his wife. And she said he had traveled, but he had left instructions that she responds to me. Yeah. And so at that point, I really, really was in love with literature and I knew it's, uh, it's what I had wanted to do. But, um, Before that, in secondary school, I didn't know there would be a career in literature other than teaching literature. And so I chose to be a teacher of of literature. That is how I launch (laughs) into being a teacher, uh, uh, a teacher of literature. And as training in that literature, then you, you know, you get into assignments in, um, in creative writing you interact with teachers who have written, you interact with other people who have written. And so, yeah, so eventually I thought, hmm, I think I, I can try it. I think I can write. So that is how I got, uh, I got into it. And very fortunately, uh, one of my teachers, again, God rest her soul, Hope Keshubi, she had written, I think she's published, she had written a bit, and she started looking out for us and encouraging us to write. She and another teacher, Professor Otim Rugamba. So while at college, they started telling us, yes, you can write. Yes, you can, you can publish a poem. You can publish a story. You can, you can, you can, you can. And from there, yeah, I knew I could. And that's how I got into it. 
You know, sometimes we, again, undervalue the influence teachers can have on students and even vice versa. Look at how the encouragement of your teachers, you know, impacted your career. They were great teachers. They were really, really great teachers. I miss them. I exchanged letters with them. When I left college, I kept writing to them and they kind of became my career, career parents. When you were a literature teacher, you found out there wasn't a lot of books written by women and even Ugandans. Take us through how that made you feel and the attempts you made to change the status quo. Yes, as, as a teacher then I saw that very big gap and I think it's partly what has turned me into a literary activist because then you realize that you're not part of the mainstream literary canon in the country. You, you get sidelined in a, in a way like doubly because as there's very, very minimal women's literature that is in mainstream, in, in mainstream literary canon that is taught in schools. And then also as a teacher at that time, you would find one book or even sometimes no book by a Ugandan writer on the syllabus. I think that is how I got to really be very, very inspired by people like Ngugi Wadhiongo because I, there wasn't, I, ha, I didn't, I hadn't read any other Ugandan at, at the time. Yeah. So for me, it became a question of, of voice. Where then are our voices? Where are the women's literary voices? Where are the Ugandan literary voices? And so immediately I started teaching. I started looking out for groups that then launched me into literary spaces, that launched me into women's empowerment spaces. Uh, before I even left university, I, I joined uh, the part of the women who were who were forming fem rights, uh, the few women who were forming fem rights, because the founder, the, the f main founder of fem right was teaching me at university. And so she made her idea known to us, and a few of us from university joined her. So at that point, it was clear to me already that very few women were writing, or even very few women were getting into where literature was, where literature was taught, where literature was discussed. And so I knew that I wanted to belong there because that I knew then that that's the path I had chosen. That I had chosen literature, I had chosen literary arts, and so I knew a better space, being part of the voices, being part of the team, the force that was contributing to to building a better space for literary arts. After joining FemRight and I was serving on the board, I served on the board for some time. FemRight is Uganda Women Writers Association. After that, I thought, I think I would like to do more than just teaching, but to be part of the team that is creating texts, the team that is engaged, more engaged in literary activism. And that's when I made a mad move of stepping out of a pensionable, permanent and pensionable, uh, pensionable job of a teacher because I was on the payroll, on the government payroll. And I stepped out. I stepped out and went into volunteering yeah, uh, in femright. I remember a friend of mine, <laughs> she's, she's called Philo. I remember Philo calling me up and saying, you can't, you can't do that because you, there's, you're doing a lot, um, volunteering with the organization. I don't think you should leave a, a paid job permanent to go and, and, and do that, go into NGO. NGO world, just like that. 
maybe another time you'll be more ready. And I said, no, I think this is where I would like to be. FemRight has introduced me to a lot of initiatives that are into literary activism, both in the country, you know, and and outside of the country. So I find myself moving with other groups on the continent, out, uh, outside the continent, looking at how we make literature important, looking at how we center literature into the important spaces of policy, important spaces of development. How do we use literature? How do we use our stories to build an even better society? Yeah. Um, um, I, I work a lot with other initiatives. Yeah. And it is because at personal level, you realize the importance you, you have you attach a lot of importance to voice. You attach a lot of importance to our stories. Our, de- our stories define us. Our stories say who we are. And so when our stories are sidelined, then our lives are sidelined. So it is important that we always find spaces for our stories, our voices. Let's get a bit into fem rights. It's been around for almost three decades. How much of a game changer has it been in the literary space in Uganda? Yeah, it is one of the, one of the literary organizations that has really stood the test of time. In the formative years, in the earlier years of fem rights, when, uh, that, that time, my predecessor, uh, uh, the organization was coordinated by Goretti, Goretti Chomhendo. And we were really ambitious. At one point, the first, we, we, we launched, um, I think there were five titles, five books, I think. I'm not so, so sure about the number, but it was such a big number from nothing to about five titles. And then an article came out and the article said, these, uh, these women are probably only, only trying to justify funding, but let's wait and see what happens next. And the, the, as in the formative years, the struggle was the, the women are not writing. There was hardly anything in the country written by women. And so after that article, so many years later, another article gets written and the the journalist the the writer of the the title actually of the article was ugandan women shine where are the men i think something like that ugandan women writers shine where are the men so that shifts from hardly any woman writer to ugandan women writers shine where are the male writers I think for me, that maps the femme right journey. That tells, that, that gives us the contribution of femme right in terms of empowering women writers. There's been a lot of women who have gone through femme rights who have won awards. A lot of important national and international awards. And I think that is a big milestone. That's a big achievement for the organization to move from nothing to awards. That is, that's very important. There's still a bit of struggle of getting into the spaces that matter. There are a lot of works which have won awards internationally. But when you come down to the Ugandan context, in Uganda, the biggest reading space is schools. 
because uh, I mean we've all been complaining about the reading culture in the country, especially reading of literature, literary texts. And so when we write and we do not get into uh, into schools and into universities, there is still a big gap. Then we are not, you know, we are not moving into the spaces that are shaping the literary canon of, of the country and of the continent. But that is why now we, we, we are focusing as, um, in terms of literary activism. But also I really uh, we appreciate the fact that our books, uh, the universities are teaching them. The very first time I felt, uh, I felt really good and, and about my work. There's a small story that I wrote, I think my very first story. And I was moving, I was at National Theatre in Uganda and a Someone, a girl came over and she said, you're healed. I said, yes. And she said, I love your story, becoming a woman. And she said after, I didn't know her, so she introduced herself. And later she told me that um, uh, their teacher, Dr. Nambi, was, was using that story to teach about women, women empowerment. And uh, people like Dr. Bila has used femoroid books a lot in her presentations in the country, in class, you know, to speak about women empowerment and literature. So that's, that's also a milestone that our books are moving into those spaces to influence social behavior, to influence how society lives and thinks today. And that is very critical for uh, for writers. Hilda, you've been a bit frustrated about why women's literature cannot exist as just literature for the society. Tell me your feelings about this constant need to differentiate. Yes, um, Betty, that, that is frustrating. That is frustrating because when, when we are speaking about books written by by men, they are simply, <laughs> they are simply books. They are not men's books. And that othering of women's literature is very, very disturbing because you cannot find a book and it is just about women. You cannot find a woman's piece of work and it's just talking about women, you know, because the literature that women write is literature for the society. It's literature for the community. And so that tag of, you know, women's things is, 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 is not even right. It's not just disturbing, but it is wrong. All literature is literature. We do not need the tags. We do not need the tags because they are wrong. They are disturbing. When we write, we write about the same things. We will approach them differently. We will write about them differently because we experience them differently, because we interpret them differently. But they are the same things. It is the same literature. And so I really would like to encourage people to not look at women's works with the tag of women's works. No, it is all literature. It, all of it contributes to building a stronger literary canon. Writing, you contend, is a form of activism. And I feel sometimes writers take this role of activism in their work for granted. You may not set out to do activism in your work, but writing, voice, Within themselves, you may not think about it. You may not do it uh, deliberately, but the act of writing, the act of voice is an act of activism within itself. And so even if you took it for granted, people will read things into your writing. And so it is important that 
you give people what you would want them to read into your writing and and otherwise otherwise they will they will have their own reading of what you're writing so i think it's important it's important uh, that we pay attention i i do remember a few um in 2016 we hosted we hosted professor pumla dineo gola from south africa and i was so thrilled she gave a keynote address i was so thrilled by her keynote address about literature about writing and one specific thing that um i have just written about in uh, in an introduction to a book that we are doing right now uh, which is titled um this bridge called woman and in the introduction to that book i have quoted pumla what she said at that meeting at fem right at 20 She said while other people go on streets to riot writers riot with their pens writers riot with their keyboards and so for me that answers that activism thing that that we cannot take it for granted and so the act of writing within itself whether you intend it or not whether you deliberate about it or not it is an act of activism and so why not do it well and do it deliberately what we write is so critical that we cannot just write because someone is going to read us someone is going a book unlike you know unlike our voices when we speak is so different a story a poem is so different uh probably the other thing that um that I, i find critical and that we are not paying much attention to is the act of editing editing other people's work because you know some sometimes you you may you as a writer might not realize that the statement that you have made is probably going to be a statement that might not be positive be taken positively or might um influence people uh, negatively but as an editor yeah as an editor of our of a piece of work you should be able to catch it you should be able to like uh, uh, now if i if i am editing a, a children's story book and i have the father is reading a newspaper and the mother is probably grinding or doing well. i will not leave that story like that because then i'm aware of the f- of how stories have been used to build stereotypes sometimes stereotypes that are not that are not helping society grow and so I really would like to speak to people who edit to be deliberate again be deliberate about catching the concepts and having conversations with authors so that we build literature that is going to transform society it is critical it is very very important Indeed that is very important that is very important and this will bring me to the question of safety for women in particular in the activism space in Uganda how safely are women navigating the space I love the community of women because I really think that Uganda's uh, women activist community is um, it I would dare describe it as a as a solid community because many times you feel the sisterhood you feel that you're supporting each other you feel that you're there for each other but um the 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 challenge sometimes comes with people not understanding 
or people choosing to understand it in a different way. And so when, for example, you say you're feminist, then straight away, people think that you're a, ma a, a, a man hater. And that's not, that's not what it is. Those attacks make it so difficult. And I think sometimes they are also used to silence, to silence the activism because then they know, um, then I know as Hilda, if I am told I am lesbian because I'm speaking for women's rights, then I will probably shun away. And whether I am or I am not, that has nothing to do with rights, you know, with women's rights. We, we all want to be in a certain space. So I think, I feel that sometimes uh, people will be harsh, not because, um, not because they just want to be harsh, but then they want you silent. And so I think why we meet a lot of resistance is because, you know, because the other party is, is a beneficiary. And so sometimes maybe they... They may even not be, you know, not be, do it deliberately, but because it is okay, they don't feel it because they are the beneficiaries of the system. And so, which takes me again <laughs> to another book that I wrote, uh, that I read by, um, by Alice Walker. In uh, one of the characters, I think, I think it's Tashi. Tashi, a character in, um, uh, what's the book? I will remember, but it's a book on circumcision. And one of the characters says, if you are quiet, if you're quiet about your pain, your pain will kill you and someone will say that you enjoyed it. Something like that, which again takes me to the fact that we must speak. Otherwise, our pain will kill us. Our pain will become a thorn. It will grow into something that we cannot control and we shall die. And so whether activism is a tough, a tough space, we do not seem to have a choice. We do not seem to have a choice. That is very profound. And if we don't speak about our pain, people will think we are enjoying it. So we need to speak up and not give up. Being a writer, I assume, can be initially intimidating because you open yourself up to be judged and criticized, sometimes very harshly. For young women writers who are starting out and don't know the spaces to take advantage of to hone their craft, what are your words of encouragement to them? I know that in Uganda, there's been um, lantern meat of poets, which also brings young poets together. Right now, there's the Poets Association of Uganda, PAO. There's... Um, uh, there, there is rightivism. It's, uh, I think right now it's under hiatus. But, uh, what I would like to appreciate about groups is that they, they kind of form a security net, a safety net around us. And so starting out, it would be, it, it, it would be nice to start out, you know, in such groups. When you get into such groups for the young people, you will certainly there will be someone that you will hook up with, and so for for it's a, it's a very very good space to start from looking out for such groups, so that you have that safety net around you, and then later after you've grown your teeth then you can, you can get out and fight and know that you can also bite, uh, bite others when you get, when you get beaten. But yeah. So for me, those are advantages of groups that you then have your first readers in this, in these groups, in these clubs, in these, um, in these initiatives 
before you take your work to the wider uh, to the wider public it helps a lot then you know what to expect but also you know how to deal with public criticism uh, of of your writing so that's what that would be my my first advice this podcast is called inspiring open and the aim is to share stories and experiences build communities and ultimately just promote the culture of openness because we believe that is how our work we do gets further and impactful so what does open mean to you hilda i think for me open is a position of honesty a position of vulnerability many times i think we are not open about who we are about our vulnerabilities because we forget that we occupy the same space as humans and and we concentrate on ourselves and then that puts us into a space of of fear a space of fear of being judged yeah and so yes <laughs> open i i interpret it as as that space of honesty that space of facing a fellow human being in putting them in the same space as i am and then they choose how they would like to respond to me that is how that is how i interpret openness you know any time i pose this question to my guest i get something new all the time my mind is drawn to other interpretations i have never thought of or even considered so it has become my favorite question and this will bring me to my final question and that is what kind of uganda do you want your grandchildren to experience oh that is interesting because <laughs> i think my answer merges into what we've just been speaking about and that is about openness that is about vulnerability that is about honesty yeah and so i would like a uganda that will embrace my children from that point of view that that my children can step out and know that they they are safe with the community and know that they can be themselves they can be open they can be honest they can be vulnerable and still be safe and so i hope that that we build our communities in a way that they can be that that they can be safe spaces where we can walk into in our truest in our truest our highest personalities and we are still we are still safe that my daughter can walk in here and say hi i am stella i am a feminist and she is interpreted for who she is for the feminist that she is not be given tags because she has given that description of herself a space that gives them that security politically religiously um socially all round that is that is the kind of space that i would want yes 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 we all do have a part to play to make our societies better and safer for all of us and we cannot relent on our individual responsibilities towards this and on that note Thank you Hilda for your time. I loved talking to you. Thank you Betty. Thank you very much. Thank you for creating this space so that more and more women's voices can be heard. I do appreciate immensely 
uh, the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you, Hilda, for the work you do to nurture generations of female writers on the continent. That was Hilda Twanjere, a writer, editor, feminist, and founding member of FemRight. Thank you for listening to Inspiring Open, a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women. This first series of Inspiring Open was funded through the International Relief Fund for Organizations in Culture and Education 2021, an initiative of the German Federal Foreign Office, the Gothi Institute and other partners, and an annual grant from the Wikimedia Foundation. If you enjoyed today's show, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Feel free to share, rate, and review us. We appreciate the support. You can also tag us in your posts. We are at Wiki Loves Women on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'll leave you with the words of Ntozake Shange. Sisterhood is important because we are all we have to stand on. We have to stand near and by each other, pray for one another, and share the joys and the difficulties that women face in the world today. If we don't talk about it amongst ourselves, then we are made silent by the patriarchy, and that serves us no purpose. Until next time, look after yourselves and your sisters. And remember, be inspired, be challenged, be bold. I am Betty Kankambwedu, and you've been listening to Wiki Loves Women, Inspiring Open. <laughs>